Well, we've heard it, we've spoken it a zillion different times, but I can't turn anywhere that I don't hear the same thing over and over and over again. The United States is in the gravest position as a nation that we've ever been in in our history. Every time we think something's nailed down that would never come up, bang, it's come up. And there's so much confusion, frustration, depression, anger, and fear. And I look around and I say, Lord, where are the heroes? Where are the heroines? Where are those leaders in every walk of life? Commercial world, educational world, religious world, wherever you turn, where are those people we can look to and say, there is a man, there is a woman who stands before God, who loves him, who loves people, has integrity and purity and the highest, highest desire for everybody around them to be successful and full and have a life that's worth living. Where are they? Where do you turn? And then we back up and say, Lord, are you showing us something we've missed? Are you teaching us something that we need to be taught? And so I turned to the Old Testament of all places. The Old Testament is a book of salvation history. It tells us how God selected a strange group of people, the Jews, in a little bitty peanut country at the backside of nowhere and sought to build in their life those basic things it takes for people to live fully and completely in this world. We have prophecy that tells us about the coming of Jesus. We have lessons that are learned of how to live and how to relate to one another. And so the book of the Old Testament is an illustration for you and me to understand some basic principles of living. They're right there for us. And I've just pulled out three of them, lessons that we need to know, lessons that are taught in the wilderness, lessons that are taught at a place called Elam, and lessons that are taught in a muddy old river called the Jordan. So I thought we'd just pause and look at those lessons that are there for us. Open your Bibles, the book of Exodus, 13th chapter. Moses had come to lead God's people out of slavery, out of captivity in Egypt. They had turned and they'd started for the promised land. And then all of a sudden, things began to happen. And in the 13th chapter, we read, Then it came to pass, when Pharaoh had let the people go, that God did not lead them by the way of the land of the Philistines, although that was near. So God led the people around the way, by by way of the wilderness of the Red Sea. What is that about? It says God didn't lead a million, million and a half people out of slavery. The the near way, which would go through the land of the Philistines, God led them about the long way around by way of the Red Sea. Why in the world would God do that? From Egypt to Canaan, the Holy Land, is about 200 miles. It would take a camel caravan about 10 days to go that 200 miles, straight shot. It would take flying by plane, what, about an hour? 
But you know how long it took those Israelites to get from Egypt to the promised land? 40 years. <laughs> what in the world happened? The book of Hebrews tells us they did not go immediately into the land because of their unbelief. Interesting. I think that means they were not ready. They were not ready to go into the promised land because what happened in those 40 years? The tabernacle came. They learned how to worship God. Principles of living came. They learned how to relate to one another. The Ten Commandments was given. So it took 40 years, could have taken 10 days, to get the slaves out of the slave mentality that they had. Interesting. I wonder if anybody knows the significance of June the 12th. What's important in history that happened on June the 12th? Can anybody tell me? Lift your hand. Huh. I've asked that in other services. Nobody knew then either. Very interesting. On this day in 1987, President Ronald Reagan stood by the wall there that divided East and West Germany, and he said, Mr. Gorbachev, Tear down this wall, that which had divided the people of Germany for about 35 years. And in 1987, that wall was torn down. Quite a moment in history. By the way, somebody brought me a piece of that wall. I have it in a frame there in my office. I had a chance of going to East Germany years ago when I went and the contrast between the East and the West was so dramatic. The East, socialism, communism was barren. It was, it was a city in shambles where the West was affluent and going. And anybody who questions how effective socialism is, all you have to do is go to a socialistic country and figure it out. It won't take you long to know it just doesn't work. But there they tore down that wall. And those people who were in East Germany who'd been slaves for so long, they just flew into West Germany, thousands of them, over two million in a short period of time, reuniting with family and friends, and they had been in captivity of a slave-like communistic government. And now they were going on and they were free. But an amazing thing happened in about... Six months or a year, a lot of those who had been in slavery all those years weren't able to handle freedom. They weren't able to handle all the decisions that the government made for them for so long. The leadership had been bled out of them. So some of them went back into slavery, back into communism. Amazing, isn't it? You see what happened here God led the Israelites about around the long way around, 40 years, to get into the promised land because they weren't ready to go there immediately. You see, the problem we have in our modern society, all of us want things right now. Man, we're back up in the traffic. There's been a wreck up there. They were on the highway, and we sit there. <laughs> cool it, folks. <laughs> Opportunity. Take a deep breath. Back up. Relax. You know, I've learned a long time ago, it's better to be Ed Young late than the late Ed Young. Have you noticed that? <laughs> it's a lesson we need to learn, but we're in a hurry. Little girl's in a grocery store, and she said, Mommy, man, I found it. I found it. And she said, put that back, honey. You have to cook that. I mean... We, we like things quick, do we not? Right now. Uh, they've got the one-minute manager, the one-minute father. We want to do things now. Let's get it over by yesterday. And our whole life is just... You know the problem with that? There's no shortcuts. There's no shortcuts to maturity. And so many times, too much too soon, too soon spells mediocrity for anybody. We need to go learn something, the lessons of the wilderness, and you live for a while, 
you'll know something about the wilderness. Moments of trial, moments of pressure, moments of fear. The wilderness. We're in a wilderness in one sense right now, and we need to learn the lesson of the wilderness. That's what God was teaching those Israelites. A roundabout way. Too much too soon destroys anybody. The name Bud Post won't mean anything to anybody here, but a few years back, he won the Pennsylvania Lottery, $16.2 million. Whew, shazam. Man, instant everything, right? But Bud immediately was sued by an ex-girlfriend, <laughs> said they were together when he bought the ticket, and, and she won the suit. Oh, yeah. Only in the U.S. courts. And she got a part of it. And then his brother, literally, true story, put a contract on him to somebody to kill him so he would inherit what was left. Oh, yeah. And all of a sudden, he found family he'd never heard of, cousins, aunts, uncles, everybody. Oh, bud, I mean, won't you help me? I mean, don't you care? And then he did the smart thing, went out and bought an airplane. Yeah, two engine. Couldn't fly, didn't know anything about planes, but... Bought a plane. Then he went out and bought a restaurant. Didn't intend to run it. He just thought, well, it's good business. And then all of a sudden, he owed a million dollars. And he declared bankruptcy. Sued by your ex-girlfriend. Hit contract put on you by your brother. Bought an airplane, bought a restaurant. Owed a million dollars. And he declared bankruptcy. All that happens in one month. In one month, too much, too soon, not able to handle it. God was preparing the Israelites for a wonderful time in their life, preparing them to be his people so they couldn't just go 10 days, zip, right in the promised land. They had to wander around in the wilderness, you know, fire by night to keep them warm, cloud by day to cover them from the heat. They had to grow up. They had to mature. And there's no such thing as somebody coming from a pagan lifestyle and coming to Christ out of slavery to freedom. It takes a while for us to mature and grow up and recognize exactly what we have in the Lord as he runs our life. Maturity, round about through the wilderness. Jesus was tempted when he came out of baptism, remember? Satan came, and he began to tempt him. His first temptation was, hey, take those stones and turn them into bread. You can feed everybody. You see, Jesus' purpose was to win the world to God, to him, for a new life. And Satan says, man, you feed everybody. <laughs> they'll come. They'll follow, won't they? Instant gratitude. Kingdom come now. Jesus resisted that temptation. Next temptation, man, go up there on the top of the temple and jump down. Oh, man, the Lord will protect you. You're his son. Everybody will know who you are. Instant bang. Hey, you got everybody. Everybody's saved. Jesus used shortcuts. No shortcuts to paradise. Then Satan said it took him up to big mountains and look around. All that belongs to me. Just bow your knee to me one time and bang. You've got the whole world. Jesus said, get thee behind me, Satan. See, he knew there was no shortcuts to accomplish in his life what God positioned him and called him to do as his son because he knew it would lead to a cross. No shortcuts. In the wilderness, ladies and gentlemen, and I've been there, I'll be there again. Many of you have been there. We need to learn the lessons of the wilderness that prepares us for the promised land. So that's the scripture I want us to look at to kind of see where we are. And we are in a wilderness. I have spoken out against every person who sat in the White House. Some of you don't know that. When they stumble and fail morally or do something super stupidly, I speak to power. That's what I do. That's a part of the purpose and the call of the body of Christ. But recently, our president, I don't know who writes his cards for him, but somebody does. 
said, I believe one of the most amazing things I've ever heard from any person who is standing up straight and upright and still living. He said, our problems are basically, I'm paraphrasing, over in America as far as inflation is concerned because everything is better except food and gasoline. He said that. In other words, if you don't want to go anywhere, you don't want to eat, everything's great. <laughs> My point is, you will see in a few minutes that in pagan countries, the leaders speak to the religious people. In God-fearing companies, the religious people hopefully speak to power. And that's what we must do. How we need, in the wilderness in which we find ourselves, to God to find some young men and young women, and maybe many of them will be on our beach retreat, and they'll grow up and become stalwart men and women of God that'll make a difference in this America that most of us have failed in, in what we've done. <laughs> Next thing, I want to take you on a trip to a little place called Elam, Exodus chapter 15. The Israelites are still in the wilderness, and they are murmuring because they have been brought to some water that was bitter, the waters of Merah. And then Moses asked God how the waters could be made sweet, and God said, cut down a tree and put it in the water. How God uses trees, right, cross. And the, and the water will be sweet. And then we read, and he said, if you diligently heed the voice of the Lord, this is God's people, the Lord your God, and do what is right in his sight, give ear to his commandments, and keep his statutes, I will put none of the diseases on you which I have brought on the Egyptians. For I am the Lord who heals. What's he saying? To live the Christian life, we do get sick. We do die. We do have diseases, but nothing like those who walk outside the will and the path of God. He said he's in the business of healing, trying to heal his people. And then we have this great little verse, Exodus 15, verse 27. And then they came to Elam, the Israelites, where there were 12 springs of water and 70 pond trees. So they camped there by the waters. Man, I love that verse. There were 12 springs of water and 70 palm trees. <sighs> Wouldn't you like to be there? They were in the wilderness, but there in the middle of the wilderness, there they found an oasis. There they found a place to camp. There they found 12 springs of water and 70 palm trees. All of us need that, folks. Find that in your house. Find that in your quiet place. Find that place in the morning. Find that place at night. And just sit down, and you may not believe it, but God may want to say something to you. Would you believe that? But we're just talking and moving and chattering and listening. When in the world we're going to sit down and enjoy 12 springs of water and 70 palm trees. You know, they're everywhere. Find time for that. You see, life is so quick and it's so full, we forget to give time for God. Let me tell you how what happens to every one of us physiologically every day. Every day, this happens to you and me. Our heart beats 103,379 times. Blood travels in your body and mine 168 miles. We breathe 23,000 23,040 times. We inhale 438 cubic feet of air. We eat three and a half pounds of food, some more than that. Uh, we drink two pounds of liquid. We perspire a half pint. We generate 40 to 50 tons of energy. We speak about 4,800 words. We move 750 major muscles and exercise 7 million brain cells every single day. Whew. 
<laughs> I'm tired already in the next week, aren't you? <laughs> you ask any doctor who would like this. You ask any, any, ask any doctor, and when somebody goes to them, what's the first thing most all the patients say? They say, what's wrong with you? And the answer they give 99 times almost out of 100 is I'm tired, right? I'm tired in the morning. I'm tired midday. I get tired in the afternoon, and I'm exhausted at night. The reason is perhaps some of us need just simply to whew, sit down and rest. You know, just find where there are 12 springs of water, 70 palm trees. My, my, my. That's a lesson we need to learn. Just to slow down. Take a time out every single day. And I'll tell you what experience I have, those little mini Sabbaths that we have. <sighs> They're so refreshing. I've awakened two or three people, put two to sleep. <laughs> Learn the lessons that God taught those Israelites in the wilderness, whatever you're going through. Boy, you find where they're quiet place, separate place, 12 springs of water, 70 palm trees. Then we're going to learn something not only in the wilderness, not only there by the springs of water, Go to 2 Kings chapter 5. Israel is an established nation. Look what happens. Now Naaman, commander of the army of the king of Syria, was a great and honorable man in the eyes of his master because by him the Lord had given victory to Syria. He was a mighty man of valor, but he was a leper. Huh commander of the most powerful army in the world, defeated all comers, medals all over his uniform, to the right hand of the most powerful king on earth. Man, he was a great man, the Bible says, a valiant man, a mighty man, but he was a leper. And I can assure you that in his home, his family sort of a shadow Fell. We know that feeling when serious illnesses come to our homes. Sort of a shadow fell, and all of a sudden, a little servant there in the household of Naaman, a little Jewish girl who was a slave. Remember they brought the Jews into captivity? One was in the house of Naaman there in Syria, and she noticed what was happening, and she spoke to Naaman's wife and said, you know, I know your husband is sick. I know he has leprosy, but there's a man back in my home country, Israel, who heals folks with leprosy. And so that little Jewish girl told the wife of Naaman, and Naaman told the king of Syria, and the king of Syria said, no problem. We control Israel. They're a vassal state of ours. I'll write a letter. And you go down there and let this man heal you. And so the king wrote a letter, the king of Israel, and said, I'm sending my strongest man, the, my right hand to you. He has leprosy. See that he gets healed. And so Naaman, man, he was encouraged. He got all whole troops together. He got chariots full of precious food. And he got, how many, 16 changes of clothing? gold and silver, and suddenly he marched out of Syria all the way down to Jerusalem to meet the king so he could get healed. And the king invited him in, and he gave the letter from the king of Syria to the king of Israel. The king of Israel read it and said, oh, who am I? Does he think I'm God, that I can heal people? Man, he's trying to pick a fight with me. He wants to come and take over and slaughter the Israelites once again. And, and the king of Israel began to tear off his clothes. But there was a witness there. Notice God had a witness there in the household of Naaman in Syria. He had a witness there in the household of the king of Israel. And this witness says, look, Elisha, that prophet, 
that is spoken to power to the king, and king didn't like him very much, I guarantee you that. He has spoken truth to him. And so the king said, well, I'll just send a note down, and I'll tell Elisha to heal you. And so Naaman got up, and he got all of his forces together, all of his wealth, all of his impressive credentials, and he, he went down to a little house where the prophet Elisha lived, and he went to the door and knocked on the door, and Elisha's servant came out, Gehazi. He said, what can I do for you? He said, here's a king, a letter from the king of Israel, and here's a letter of the king of Syria. You tell your guy, the prophet, to come out and heal me of leprosy. And so the servant went back in. Elisha was busy praying, reading scripture. I don't know. May have been eating a meal. And Elisha said, oh, oh go tell, go tell, what, what's his name? To, to go wash in the Jordan seven times and, and he'll be healed. And so the servant went out and told Naaman. He said, you know, he said, you go take a bath, wash seven times in the Jordan River and you'll be healed of your leprosy. And Naaman was furious. You see, he was an important guy. He was a big shot in the world. And here, Man, the king of Israel didn't pay any attention to him. He was worried about invasion. And here's this one horse backcountry preacher back here. He wouldn't even come out. And he said, at least, at least I thought he'd come out and, and strike the place or he would call on his God or do something. And he just sends his servant out to tell me to go take a bath seven times in the Jordan River, that muddy old river where all common sinners washed. And he said, are not the Urbana and the Farpar, the rivers of Damascus, greater than all the waters of Israel? And ladies and gentlemen, that's absolutely true. Man, the Tigris, Euphrates, Urbana, and in, in Syria, they were big, deep, beautiful, clear, magnificent, strong rivers. And there was the Jordan, that muddy old river. I mean, it is. We call it Texas a Creek. Half the time, you can jump across the Jordan. And when, when the ice is not melt, melting on Mount Hermon, I baptized hundreds of people there, and it is muddy. Catfish run around your feet when you get in it. It's a muddy old river. It's nothing. It's just a little old bitty creek. And here Naaman says, man, are not every water in Israel doesn't live up to the Abana and the Farfar in Syria? He said, I'm, in so many words, I'm a big shot. The king of Israel didn't pay attention to me. This prophet didn't even come out to see me. He said, I'm out of here. I'm not going to take a bath, go down seven times in that muddy old river where all common sinners have washed. So he gets up his troops. Read it there in the scripture. He takes off. He said, we're heading back home. But they went a little ways away. And one of the servants of this great general said, Master, if he told you to do some great thing, give great hordes of gold or do something really big, and you would have done it to be healed of your leprosy, wouldn't you? They were nodded. He said, how much better to go and just wash in that muddy old river? Now, Naaman was great, but he's a leper. The sun must have shone through his silken garment, and he saw those white spots, and he knew the direction it was going, a terminal, deadly disease. So Naaman turned around, went back to that muddy old river, the Jordan, took off his coat with all the medals and all the badges and all the stars, took off those boots, his pants, and he waited out there in the Jordan River, that muddy old river. For all common sinners has washed, and, and he thought, well, I'm going to be the laughing stock of Damascus in the morning. But he went down once, twice, three times, four times, five times, six times, and he came up the seventh time, and the Bible said his skin was like the skin of a newborn baby. He was healed. A 
are not their waters of Syria. They are abiding in the far part, greater than all the waters of Israel. Ladies and gentlemen, we in the 21st century have waited and we've bathed in all kind of waters, sparkling waters that will give answers to life. Some belief, some cult, some ideology, some prosperity, something, oh, we're going to have it all. When I get this, when I, oh, no. We tried all the sparkling waters, but none of them healed us because healing comes from that muddy old river where all common sinners watch, the river that we enter when we receive Jesus Christ, and he changes lives and changes hearts and washes away all sin. That takes humility, humility, humility. That's what we need to learn while we're in the wilderness, right? That's what God will teach us somehow when we're at Elam with 12 springs of water and 70 palm trees along with God. And that's what he teaches us as we need to come to Christ in humility and brokenness and say, I've, I've tried everything else, but now I come to Christ and I'm willing to go and humble myself and be baptized and have a new life, a symbol of what God is doing for me. Ladies and gentlemen, there's no answer to healing. There's no answer to life that doesn't come by humility and involves in some way bathing in, being cleansed by the muddy old river where all common sinners have been cleansed and washed in the blood of Jesus Christ for all these hundreds of years. Heavenly Father, our Lord and our God, we've tried it all, some of us, but now we come to the point we say, you know, I'm ready to be humble. I've been in the wilderness. I'm ready to come out. I'm ready to sit by those springs and get under those palm trees where God can speak and he's spoken to me maybe today you could say and now I'm ready to put my flag up for Jesus Christ and have that new life to be healed within and without Lord I'm humble enough and maybe desperate enough to confess sin to turn from sin and to ask Jesus Christ to come in and take over my life Lord, many need to do that today. You know who they are. I don't. Speak with your spirit in their heart of hearts as we sing this hymn of decision and invitation is our prayer.